Welcome to Heart Talk. Today we have with us Bishop Paul Hender, Apostolic Vicar of Southern Arabia. Paul Hender, welcome to Heart Talk. So lovely to have you here and thanks for spending time with us. It's my pleasure too. Bishop, it's so lovely to have you here and I'm sure a lot of people are looking forward to getting to know you a lot more. Can you firstly though go back a few years when you were still a child um, and I believe that you grew up in Switzerland. Tell me a bit about what were the highlights there? Well, I was born in the midst of the war the big war in 42. Of course, I can't remember the war as such, except uh, the time immediately afterwards. I was born in a family, very simple conditions, a farmer's family. We had a few cows and uh, what we needed for our life, but uh, very, very simple. I was the last of four sons. I have no sister. The highlights, I would say, as a child were, first of all, I liked to go to school, elementary school. Uh, I was waiting at the end of the holidays that I could go back to the school. And uh, that was a good time. Also, we had different teachers in a few uh, times. But I remember the elementary school really with uh, fond uh, memories. Back home, we were, I would say, what we would call nowadays a good Catholic family, not exaggerating, but practicing. We were rather far away from the church. That means we had to go, especially at that time, on, very often on foot, one hour to go to the mass. And uh, the school was in another direction. That means normally during the week we couldn't go that. Back home, uh, the style, the lifestyle was, as I said, simple. The eating was good, but simple. I had, as it was the custom at that time, in the free time to work. We had little time for games and so on. Uh, we had to help on the farm, especially during the times when there was the hay to be done or the harvest and so on, or collecting the apples or the potatoes a work I didn't like at all. <laughs> the most, uh, the works which were a little bit uh, unpleasant, they became almost pleasant when I could go with my mother because I liked to work when my mother was present. It was less pleasant when I was with my father, although he was a very good man, but he was stronger than my mother. So these are some memories of my childhood. So you were quite involved in your work life, being part of your family's farm. But were you part of other things in the church? Did you go to mass? Did you have youth groups at the time? What was it like for you? Yeah, of course, we had the ordinary prayers in the family, which were more than usually, at least in our home country, are done nowadays. But it was I would say affordable, even for a child. I like to go to mass. I became uh, later, before I joined the boarding school, an altar server. That is something I liked very much. I was in admiration of our parish priest, who was uh, rather a strong man, serious one, but one who marked me especially in his style to celebrate the liturgy. He was a prayerful man and he did all these things with dignity. And that might be one of the reasons I thought one day I would do, like to do something similar. In the family itself, we had, uh, as I said, I had three, uh, three elder brothers, 11 years older, nine years older and six years older. And the second one, he became a Benedictine monk, not a priest, a lay monk. He joined the Benedictine monastery in Einsiedeln, which was the main 
Marian Shrine in Switzerland. Later, I, me too, I was tempted to go there, but finally I decided in another way and became a Franciscan Capuchin. It must have been really exciting to enter the seminary at the time. For the seminary, you know, we had uh, what uh, maybe in other countries would be called something like a minor seminary. But in Switzerland, it was a boarding school open to all kinds of students, but of course also thought as a, a breeding place yeah. for vocations. Yeah. And I was uh, led there, maybe again under the influence of my mother who wanted, who preferred the Capuchins to the Benedictines, that was obvious, because I had also an uncle, uh, mother sites, who had been a laborer at a Capuchin. So in 55, April, I entered the boarding school and then the life changed a little bit. I was among uh, my colleagues with whom, by the way, those who are still alive, I'm still in good contact. And only recently, uh, quite a good number of them came to see me when I was in Oman and we passed one week together. That means that after 55 years or more or 60 years, we have still a good contact. So friendships have gathered. Come up. So you formed a bond with your fellow yes. priests. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like a brotherhood that helped you throughout the seminary and life. Would that be your high, like your most memorable time? Yeah, and afterwards of course uh, I was very active already at that time of the boarding school because the older we became, the more we had also internal responsibilities. Out of the, the school, I was leading the Marian congregation. I was a member of the student association. I had responsibilities to animate the liturgy already as a student at the boarding school. And that definitely helped me to prepare the way when I joined the novitiate of the Capuchins in 62. I'm sure you had a lot of struggles in your life when you were young and when you were growing, especially through a seminary. Can you recall maybe a significant one that you went through and how did that affect your life? Yes, of course, but uh, yeah. I would say the main struggles came later. Oh, but really? at, uh, oh. at, uh, at that time, of course, as an adolescent, you have the problems. Yeah. Uh, we were not uh, in a world which was completely like a monastery. But, of course, it was uh, already a clearly regulated life. And the conflicts were more on the order of uh, respecting the authority. I had some difficulties with my professors, and th the professors had some difficulties with me. But there is, for example, a, a very important uh, incident, which uh, may be worth it to tell it even here in this place, as an example how things can change. I had a very bad relationship with the Professor Capuchin who taught French and uh, I was opposing uh, and so on and every now and then I was chased away from the class out yeah. of the workroom and of course I had to go to apologize. It happened after one year or maybe more that one day before the, it was uh, before the Easter holidays when we had a break in the study hours, this capuchin again came, and when I came out, he was there. I thought, what have I done again? Then he came to see me and said, look, Paul, I did misunderstand you. After Easter, we continue in a different way. And I was so impressed that an authority could apologize to this small, bad behaving mm. uh, student. Mm. Uh, and it changed completely our relationship. We had no more a serious problem, and he even became later my confessor. So that had me taught for my own life. You should never give up, and it, you don't lose authority if you have the courage to apologize, if you feel you have behaved in a wrong way. Because how do you think Jesus helped you overcome that struggle? 
you? And how, where was he? Yeah, of course I was uh, practicing in Norway at that time. Of course, we had every day, every day the mass at the boarding school internally. That was, by the way, something wonderful compared to back home, where because of the geographical situation of our home, we didn't have this possibility. So uh, I was struggling. I had also a spiritual director to whom I uh, uh, opened my problems uh, as a, a young boy or then an adolescent yeah. man. That uh, helped me a lot uh, so in the personal prayer then to, to go forward. Yeah. Bishop Paul, can you tell me about a time when you had a turning point in your life where Jesus revealed himself to you or you had an encounter with God that really turned you upside down, that drew you closer to Christ. My life, there were not these significant moments where I can say, that was it. There was a, rather a process. Of course, there were moments where I felt I, that, is, that is now the right way, where I felt the presence of the Lord in my life. But uh, it was not what many others have, they can say, on the 22nd April 57, that was the moment of my, the turning point. Yeah. I don't have such a precise date. It was more a whole process throughout the years with significant moments, yes, but they are not dramatic, I would say. Of course, the day I decided to join the Capuchins instead of the Benedictines, that was an important point, I would say. Then the, when I joined the novitiate, that was a, a really moment hard also for my family. I remember my father was a strong man, a farmer, and uh, my mom with the cows and uh, uh, feeling. When I said goodbye before going to the novitiate, I saw how the tears came down his eyes. It was a heartbreaking moment where I could feel, oh, this, this hard man, he loved me and he will miss me. But uh, then when I was uh, the first year in the, in the Capuchin order as a novice, that was for me a good time. We were, at that time, we started as 15 novices and uh, ended up with 12, which was at that time an extraordinary number. The problems came later. Eh? Afterwards, I had for the philosophy, the theological studies, and uh, that went well. I was ordained priest in '67. It was a wonderful time. I liked to study theology, and then the life began. And I would say also sometimes the problems. Of course, it was the time of this famous 68. I, after a short practice in a parish in Basel, uh, where I had to learn a lot because I was exposed suddenly to a pastoral practice. I was not uh, very used to it. After that pastoral practice in Basel, I was sent for further studies at the university, first in Munich and then in Fribourg, uh, in Switzerland. And that was the time where I had to, I would say, renew really my vows. Because it was the time after the Vatican Council II with the whole crisis which has hit also my own province, hit my own colleagues, my friends. One suddenly, one said, I go, yeah. another went. Yeah, so renewing your vows um, again is important. How important is it for you? Or was it something that gave you the passion and the drive and the motivation to continue your calling and your vocation as a priest? Or what was it that kept you going throughout no, all no, this? It was uh, uh, renewing in the sense when suddenly those who had made with me at the same time their religious profession went another way. Then of course, automatically the question comes up, what's going on? And what about me? Why do I remain? Why do I can't follow him? I never the intention to leave. But it was a struggle because among those who left, 
were among the, my best friends. And so I be, felt us a little bit alone somehow. Huh? And that was the moment I had to deepen my own vocation and to, in that sense, to renew what previously I had done with a kind of enthusiasm uh, uh, of, of the young years. They said, uh, life is more serious than that. Pope Francis is popular, as we know. He's influential. He's influential in the Christian media and in the secular media. And he's, like I said, he's really well known. So what do you really think about Pope Francis? Uh, first of all, I like him. And I, uh, I met him, of course, more than once, also in a private audience. What was that twice. moment like? Yeah, it was uh, what uh, struck me is uh, his simplicity. But I, I experienced it also with Pope Benedict XVI. But of course, he has another style in a very uh, uncomplicated communication with the people. Huh? Yes. And uh, I think that is what attracts also the, the faithful that they feel he, he, he knows it himself, that he, he is not perfect, I am not perfect, and he has no shame to say, I'm, I, I need your help, I'm not perfect. You can even correct me. And I think, again, I come back to the example I said before, yeah. an authority who admits that uh, it, it, uh, it is not perfect, mm. uh, is getting more authority. Yeah. And I think that's uh, something which is happening a little bit with him. As far as I can see, he's very, very well estimated. For example, also among the Muslims, I'm meeting all the time. They are very impressed by this figure. Mm -hmm. And uh, how much does he attract people to become Christians? The, I think the, it, this is difficult to say because I'm always a little bit an enemy of this statistic, counting the numbers, because evangelization is something, it's not only a question of uh, figures, it's a question how a message is entering the ground like uh, any irrigation water. Hmm. And that's important. So what would you have been if you hadn't become a priest? Uh, there are different options. Uh, the one definitely would have been to become a singer or an actor. <laughs> Fabulous! <laughs> because uh, actually already yeah. during the boarding school I had special formation uh, for, uh, for my voice, for singing. And uh, later I could even continue it when I was a capuchin. It yes. helped me be, until now uh, with a professional singer. I uh, could uh, do that formation. And that was always something that would have uh, attracted me. I was a passionate uh, player on, uh, or actor oh, yes. uh, during the uh, times of the boarding school yeah. uh, and I, it always fascinated me. Do you still have a good voice? Do you still yes, sing? Yes, I think so, but you have to <laughs> ask the others. <laughs> Bishop Paul, thank you so much for spending time with us here at Shalom World TV. It's been such a pleasure to have a chat to you. And I'm sure a lot of the, our viewers, all of our viewers, um, have been enriched by what you've told us. And um, yeah, I would like to just conclude our Heart Talk program today with your prayer and blessing. Our Father in heaven, you show your love in giving us your Son, Jesus Christ, as our Redeemer, that we are knowing you are with us, truly a God with us. And you made it in a way that he sent us his Holy Spirit, that each one of us can become and is really a truly temple of you, a temple of the Holy Spirit. Make us strong and courageous that we don't have any shame 
to profess you as our God and Father, in Jesus Christ, your Son, with the Holy Spirit. Make us true witnesses of your love wherever we are, and such a way, messengers of peace and mutual understanding in our own environment and wherever we have the possibility to influence in such a way the life of the society. Let us ask this through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. And may Almighty God bless you and keep you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Bishop Paul. Welcome. Such a pleasure. Heavenly Father, I pray to you to bless Shalom TV, to bless the organizers, their families, all the collaborators. Inspire them with the spirit of wisdom to see what's to be done, courage to overcome obstacles, the generosity to sacrifice themselves for Shalom, and the realization that they're working for you, for the gospel, for our Lord Jesus Christ. Bless them. Keep them close to you and to each other. And so I now I pray for all the Shalom viewers. I pray that the Holy Spirit comes down on them, that God blesses them, blesses their family, keeps them united, that they experience the presence of God, of Jesus, in their homes and in their lives. And so I bless you with the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit come down on you and remain with you always. God bless you. Keep well. Always love Jesus.